And we are going to talk today about this gospel lesson for the day. You know, the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water. I've preached dozens of sermons over the years on the feeding of the 5,000. That was just men, by the way. You know, women and children, who knows how many. And uh, Jesus walking on the water, I've preached on that many times. And in some of the other gospel accounts, we have even Peter wanting to walk on water. And, and uh, I've been struck as I've been reading through the Gospel of Mark how many miracles there are. Matter of fact, there are a dozen miracles before we ever get to chapter 6. Uh, I hope you're reading the Gospel uh, once a week. huh? Read those 16 chapters. Uh, I'm learning things. I've been studying uh, for 52 years since I've been a pastor, the Gospels. But I still get something new every time. How many uh, of the healing miracles were driving out demons? It's amazing. Yeah, just read that Gospel lesson. And so, you know, I'm, uh, you might have thought, well, which one of these two miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 or the walking on the sea, are you going to talk about then? And the truth of the matter is I'm not going to talk about either one. Uh, I, I was thinking about the four verses that come just before these two miracles. And I was struck by what Jesus is described as. You know, he had, he had just sent the disciples out two by two, and they had been on their own for a while, healing and teaching people. And they came back, and they were so excited. They were just exuberant with all the things they were able to have done. Right? But not so much Jesus. You see, he had just been told that his cousin John had been killed by Herod. And so uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, starts off this uh, chapter 6 lesson for us today. And uh, I want to read it to you, part of it again, from uh, the message paraphrase. Okay? You know I like that paraphrase. And here's the way it reads. Uh, the apostles rendezvoused with Jesus and reported on all that they had done and taught. And Jesus says, well, come off by yourselves. Let's take a break. Let's get a little rest. For there was constant coming and going. They didn't even have time to eat. So they got in the boat and they went off to a remote place by themselves. But somebody saw them going and got the word around. And from all the surrounding towns, people went out on foot running and got there ahead of the boat. And when Jesus arrived, he saw this large crowd. And at the sight of them, his heart broke. Like sheep with no shepherd they were. And he went right to work teaching them. At the sight of the masses of people, his heart broke. Now, in the ESV translation that we use here in church and that, that I read to you earlier from, the, the word there is translated compassion. He saw the masses and he had compassion on them. The old King James Version actually has a pretty good translation too. It says he has pity on them. He has pity on them. He has compassion. It's a gut-wrenching compassion. And that's why the paraphrase says, it broke his heart. It's a deep emotion, okay? So this morning, I think we can learn some lessons in Christian compassion from Jesus. And I believe it is crystal clear that, a Christian, that Christian compassion has to be at the heart of everything we do in Christ's church today. Three lessons. Number one, compassion. First of all, we've got to open our eyes. We've got to see. Uh, that's the first thing. Or let's get personal here. As a congregation, we have to see what our mission is, or really get personal. Each individual here, follower of Jesus Christ, we have to see. Yeah? We have to open our eyes. Christ looked upon the crowd and he saw. What did he see? He saw this huge crowd, and at the sight of them, his heart broke. He had compassion, he had pity. We need to see. What Christ saw from the boat as he looked at the masses of people. And he saw them as straying sheep without a shepherd. To be a compassionate church, we need to open our eyes to see the lost sheep all around us. Lost and straying. Right? When the ocean liner, the Titanic, sunk by the iceberg and sank, they published a list in New York's harbor where the boat was supposed to have gone. Now, I know on this slide you can't really see the detail of it, but it's the actual poster. It actually appeared in the paper, 
It's the actually actual poster that was posted. And there's a list there, two lists, really. One list of all those who were lost, and another list of all those who were saved. Didn't depend upon how rich you were. Didn't matter if your cabin was a suite up on the upper decks or if you had a, 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 a staff cabin down below. They didn't list the wealthy. They didn't list the royalty. Nothing else. There's only one thing that counted on that list, whether you were saved or whether you were lost. When we look at the world today as Jesus saw it, we don't see wealth and royalty and titles, right? Fancy clothes. We see it as lost or saved. And the Lord is speaking to us who already know the shepherd, who have been gathered by the shepherd. Christ is calling us to see the world through his eyes of compassion. Have you ever wondered about that amazing word in John's Gospel, chapter 10? Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it in abundance. What does that mean? Hmm? Does it mean that a person could be alive, you know, heart beating, lungs breathing, and yet not really have abundance of life? Yes, that is exactly what it means. That there are walking dead people out there. They might be alive, but they don't have abundant life. That's what a straying sheep is. And if we open our eyes to see, they're all over the place. They're all around us. They don't know about the love of Jesus. They don't have faith, hope, and love that comes from the spirit of the living God. And that's what Jesus saw when he looked upon the crowd. He saw walking dead people. Got that? Step number two. After we see what Jesus saw, then we have to care about them like Jesus cares about them. You know, Jesus didn't have to have pity upon the straying sheep. He could have said, well, I could care less. Huh? What I talked to the kids about. He could have said that. He could have said that about you and me. It's amazing that he actually cares about us. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're told, although we'll never understand it, that before the foundations of the world were laid, he already saw Adam and Eve sinning and that the fact that we were going to need a Savior. That's the art of Christian caring, to be able to come to the aid of somebody who has a need even though it's going to cost a great deal, it costs Jesus a great deal. Loving parents, I think, know all about this. You know, but when they're just about ready to discipline a child and they say to them, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Yeah, really? Why? Because I care about you. That's why I'm doing it. Now, a, a kid is not going to understand the reality of that. And as God's kids, we have a pretty tough time, too, wondering why does God even care about us? But he does. 150 years ago, Lady Liberty was put in New York's harbor. Uh, there she is standing there on the slide, and next to her are the words that are on that plaque down at the bottom. Huh? Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I lift my lamp, there she is, beside the golden door. I think that poem has the very spirit of Christian compassion. God's word, it expresses the caring heart of Christ. Today, when we see the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, we should care about them. If we have any desire at all to be like Christ, we need to care about straying sheep. You know, the same man that created Stephen Ministry, that wonderful ministry we've had here at St. Paul's for years, his name is Ken Houck. He's from St. Louis. He developed a small group ministry called Christ Care. I like the title of that, Christ Care. Now, of course, we should have Christ Care, compassion for the sick and the dying, the lonely, the depressed, the hungry and the homeless, the abused, the addicted, the disadvantaged, the underprivileged. We should care about them all. And to that end, I'd say the church has been pretty faithful over the years. A hundred years ago, it was the church that built caring hospitals for the sick. And we built orphanages and old folks' homes and 
created social ministries because we cared, right? Christ care. But what about when we see the wandering lost, unbelievers, those who are living deceived by the lies of this world, the de church, the blasphemers, selfish skeptics, or even wayward believers? If we care about these masses, it ought to break our heart. The older I get, the more it breaks my heart to know that the church has failed over the years to reach the masses with the good news of Jesus. And that, of course, leads us then to step number three in Christian compassion, a call for action. We see, number one, we care, number two, and our caring then has to move us into action. It's part of the definition of what compassion is really all about. Oh, I know it's much more comfortable just keeping compassion a kind of an internal emotion, you know. Uh, sometimes we call it sympathy or, or we're concerned about. Yeah, that's not enough, you guys. Christ gives us action. He saw the sheep. He cared for the straying sheep. And then he died for the sheep. And he provided everything for his sheep. Our text says when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them. Next slide. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. He taught them. All day long he taught them until it was evening time. Crowds of thousands. And when it got to be dinner time, what did he do? He fed them. Don't forget that, with a few loaves and fishes. He taught them about the way he really cares. He still cares. This Christ of compassion cares for you and me, not only in the words that we are concentrating on during this Lenten season, but don't ever forget the way he miraculously provides for us in other ways. He cares for us by taking care of us. He opens up his hand and Provides for us in abundance. Twelve baskets full left over. Our landfills are filled with his abundance. And so to wrap this all up, I'm going to share something that you have never heard before. Because I just thought of it this week. I know you know about the Great Commission, but I'd like to suggest to you there's also a little commission. A little commission. What do I mean? Well, the Great Commission, of course, is go into all the world. Baptize all nations. Big, big picture. Teach them everything I have commanded you. I'll be with you always. Make disciples. Got that? Sure you do. But what about the little commission? I submit to you that before we ever undertake the Great Commission, we need to examine our hearts. You know, what makes us tick? Ask yourselves. Do the same things that broke Jesus' heart when he looked upon the crowds break your hearts? They did an autopsy on the great thoroughbred secretariat. Uh, he was the horse in 1973 that won the triple crown and the last leg of that triple crown. He won by like a half mile over his competitors. Okay. They found in the autopsy that he had a heart that weighed 22 pounds. Now the average horse heart, I am told, weighs eight pounds. And so they concluded that Secretariat's great stamina came from the fact that he had an unusually large heart. Now no preacher can let that get by without using it. Unusually large heart. I believe the followers of Jesus need unusually large hearts. We can't look at the spiritual condition of America today and say, I could care less. Not my problem. When we see this nation forsaking the will of God, it ought to break our hearts. We can't see the nations of the world worshiping false gods including self-worship, and say, well, you know, that's it. I could care less. When we realize that 
There are people in the world who have never, ever been reached with the good news of God's salvation in Jesus Christ. It ought to break our hearts. We can't see people, either intentionally or unintentionally, headed for a Christless eternity in hell and say, I could care less. Deny yourself, Jesus says. Pick up that cross. Apathy is not going to work today. It never did. Our hearts ought to be broken over the lost. The little commission sees the crowd lost and wandering like sheep without a shepherd and it breaks unusually large hearts as we say I really care about that I really do these lost sheep may be maybe in our biological family even they might be in our church family I'll guarantee you they'll be among those who are your co-workers and your neighbors let alone the millions of people in the nations of the world where we ourselves maybe cannot go, but we can support missionaries, and they're all straying. Do you care? I do. And that's why the mission of this congregation, St. Paul Lutheran Church and School, March 10th, 2024, should have really exciting meaning to us to be a part of this endeavor. Our gathering together, just as Christ gathered his 12 together and sent them out, it's vital. We can't do this on our own. Get involved somehow in the ministry right here at St. Paul's. Recommit yourself, oh yes, to personal prayer and Bible study, to volunteer service, to monetary generosity, so many ways, to the Christ-like witness that you can give every day by just living by the commandments. Do it because you care, because you have unusually large hearts for the lost. We in the church need to be filled with Christ-like compassion for all those around us. Anything less should break our hearts. Will you pray with me? Lord of the church, God of our salvation, for such a time as this, you have given us the privilege of looking and seeing the world all around us, some, sometimes very close to us, other times halfway around the world, doesn't matter. There are walking dead people out there. They don't know about Jesus. They don't know about, about your love. They don't know about the sacrifice we are honoring this Lenten season. They don't know about your reckless love by which you suffered and died and by which we will place lilies and hyacinth all over this place on Easter Sunday because you gave us the victory. Lord, help us see them, help us care about them, and help us be into action in so many different ways right here in this congregation and school. Let it all be to your honor and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.